Changes to the uveitis treatment landscape after years of stagnation warrant a reset on what is approved, what the latest data are, and which developments are in the pipeline. I'm Greg Notstein, and he's Scott Chriswanis, and this is New Retina Radio's coverage of the 2021 AAO Annual Meeting. Dr. Glenn Jaffe summarized his State of the Union on uveitis therapy, reviewing data from the most recently approved innovations in the field. And Dr. Nicole Khaleesi's joins the program to review data on ocular injuries linked to social unrest in the summer of 2020. What were the causes linked to ocular injuries? How severely was vision affected? And what were the final outcomes for these patients? Keep it here to find out. Topical and systemic therapy for uveitis both work. As long as patients are compliant, they're willing to visit the clinic often, and they can tolerate the side effects of treatment. Oh, and if their disease responds to an inconstant dose of therapy. Even better, local sustained steroid therapy, which can be tailored to the patient's particular condition, alleviates issues of patient compliance, eliminates systemic side effects, and provides a constant dose of therapy. At the 2021 AAO annual meeting, Dr. Glenn Jaffe reviewed the state of uveitis treatments, and he's kind enough to join us today to review his talk. Dr. Jaffe is the Robert Mockamer Professor of Ophthalmology, the Chief of the Vitreo Retinal Division, and the Director of the Duke Reading Center, all at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Dr. Jaffe, welcome to New Retina Radio. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. You structured your update by delivery approach. Intravitreal injections, intraocular sustained delivery implants, and gene therapy. Let's start at the top. What updates to intravitreal therapy should our audience know about? I think the main one, Scott, is that the, there is a drug called sirolimus or rapamycin, which is very interesting because when it's given as an intravitreal injection, it essentially serves as its own delivery, impl- or delivery system. It's an mTOR inhibitor and it blocks T and B cell activation. And it's now been assessed in two different phase three studies. These were 24 month studies called Sakura one and Sakura two. And the Sakura one study met its endpoint, whereas Sakura two didn't meet the endpoint and the corporate sponsor Santin combined the data, which with when combined did show a positive result, but the FDA said, you can't do that. You have to actually have two studies that are showing a positive outcome. So as a result of that, the company Santen has undertaken a a study called Lumina, and that is the third study that's now underway. So we don't have results from that yet, but we look forward to those results. Let's move on to intravitreal implants. There are three of these approved by the FDA for the treatment of uveitis, correct? That's right. So there is one that is surgically implanted, which is the Retisir, which you're all probably familiar with. There are two of them that are given through an intravitreal injection. These are different than sirolimus. They're not actually just the drug. These are actually delivery implants themselves that contain the drug. And so one of them is the dexamethasone implant, which is also known as the Ozerdex. That was approved in 2010, and it contains 0.7 milligrams of dexamethasone. There's the fluocinolone acetonide intravitreal implant that contains 0.18 milligrams of drug. That's known as the UTIC, and that was approved in 2018. And by the way, the Redisir is a fluocinolone acetonide containing implant that contains 0.59 milligrams of drug, and that was approved in 2005. And, and just, I, I know you all know about the Redisir and the Ozerdex, but I just want to make the point that the Redisir delivers drug over about three years on average. The UTIC delivers drug about two to three years, and the Ozerdex delivers drug over about six weeks to a couple months. And so which system you choose is usually an individual decision based on the patient, their underlying disease, their previous response to therapy, et cetera. There's another drug, and this one, it doesn't really fall into the implant category. This is a sustained delivery method, which is provided by a suprachoroidal infusion. And this is a proprietary delivery method that delivers triamcinolone acetonide 
and this it was originally developed by ClearSide Biomedical, and that was approved by the FDA as Zypir in a partnership with Bosch and Lom in October 2021, so just, just recently. As you pointed out, our audience is likely familiar with Redisert and Ozerdex for your uveitis. These treatments have been around uh, for more than a decade. They may not be as familiar with UTIC and Zypir, however, so let's dive into those and let's start with UTIC. Sure. So this is really the second generation implant as an outgrowth of our work on the Redisert. And we did some original preclinical work on an injectable form of the fluocinolone implant and it was very effective in preclinical models and it based on the pharmacokinetics we predicted it would be effective as a long-term delivery system it's a fluocinolone acetonide core that's surrounded in a polyimide tube it's about three millimeters in length and you deliver it through a modified 25 gauge needle and as I mentioned previously, it's designed for release for up to three years. Practically speaking, we started to see recurrences after about two years, but in many cases, it does last the full three years. And this was evaluated in a phase three study, actually two phase three studies, but in one of those studies, which compared UTIC to sham, the key finding from the study was that the duration for recurrence of the inflammation in the sham group was 95 days, whereas it was 1,051 days in the UT group, so almost three years. So a marked difference in the time to recurrence. One of the interesting findings, and this contrasts with the findings in the, in the Redisser study, was that the intraocular pressure was similar in both groups for, throughout the study, but unlike the Redisser, there was a greatly decreased chance of requiring uh, incisional surgery. And in fact, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me was that 6% of the UT, the eyes that had the UT underwent incisional surgery and actually 12% of the sham. Now, I don't know if that's a, a real difference or not, but at least it, it makes a point that there isn't a large difference in the need for incisional surgery in the drug treated in the sham group. Yeah, point noted. Now let's get to Zypir, which as you mentioned, was approved only a few months ago. That's right. So this is injected through a proprietary supracroidal space microinjector. And th that system, as I mentioned, was developed by ClearSide Biomedical. And the, they partnered with Bosch and Lam. And the basis for getting the drug approved were studies that were conducted in eyes that had uveitis associated macular edema. And one of the things that I think is important, un unlike the other systems that we've talked about, the Zypir system was evaluated not only in people who had macular edema with posterior uveitis, but it was also evaluated in patients who had just anterior uveitis associated macular edema. So it, it worked for both of those types of groups. It was evaluated in a phase three study called the Peach Tree trial, which found at the primary study endpoint, which was at 24 weeks, that the people who were treated with the Zypir gained about 11 more letters than the people that were in the control group. And at the same time, there was a significant difference in the thickness of the retina. There was a drop in the center subfield thickness of 135 microns relative to the control group favoring the Zypir. So the vision was improved associated with a decrease in the macular edema. And so that peach tree trial, along with the Magnolia study, which was an extension study, and then also the Azalea trial, which was an open label study, formed the basis for the successful application to the FDA to get the drug approved. And as we mentioned, that was just approved a, a couple months ago. And finally, gene therapy. I'm sure whatever is out there is early, but what is the latest? So uh, there's a very interesting system that the company Ivensis has been working on. And this is an electroporation-based therapy. Electroporation is a means by which electrical energy is delivered to tissue. And it basically permeabilizes the cells to the gene therapy product. And in this case, the ciliary body is the target of the gene therapy. So the through the electroporation process, 
an anti-tumor necrosis factor alpha plasmid is delivered to the ciliary body. And as you all know, TNF is an inflammatory cytokine thought to play a role in activating other cytokines that can cause inflammation. And so by inhibiting TNF through this anti-TNF plasmid, the idea is that you decrease the inflammation that's causing the macular edema. And so there's a phase two trial that's currently underway using this electroporation system. And in the earlier phase one study, there were some favorable signals showing that macular edema in some of these eyes can be decreased. And so it, I think this will be really interesting to follow up and see how, how the trial turns out. Well, the future certainly does look bright. Dr. Jaffe, thank you so much for joining us here on New Retina Radio. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. During the protests and social unrest of the spring and summer of 2020, ophthalmologists saw an increased volume of ocular injuries. What were those injuries? How did they occur? And what can the field learn from them? We're joined by Dr. Nicole Colises, who presented data on this topic at this year's AAO annual meeting. Dr. Colises is a retina fellow at the USC Roski Eye Institute in Los Angeles. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Scott and Greg. Thanks for having me. Let's start at the top. What are the injuries you and your team looked at? So this was a three-part study, uh, primarily a, a multi-center retrospective consecutive case series of protest-related trauma. We were also interested to evaluate the effect of KIP use, KIP being a kinetic impact projectile. Commonly, uh, we refer to this as a rubber bullet, and this name is actually a misnomer as rubber bullets can be made of other materials as well. So the more encompassing term that is used now is a kinetic impact projectile, KIP. KIPs have been used for crowd control purposes um, to temporarily incapacitate subjects. They oftentimes feature a metal core. Um, they can be launched from a distance and um, they have been notoriously known uh, to be very inaccurate also. Tell us about the injury rates you found. We had looked at 72 cases of injuries from 67 patients. The mean age was 37 years. Half of patients were white, a third black, 16% Latino, and 3% Asian. We saw that a majority, 73% of patients were protesters, 16% bystanders, 8% law enforcement, and 3% journalists. 76% of patients were not wearing any eye protection and over half of patients sustained combined ocular and adnexal injuries. KIPs weren't the only cause of ocular trauma, of course. What else was found to be at fault here? We saw leading causes of trauma were by non-KIP projectiles, such as tear gas canisters and rocks, followed by direct KIP injuries and blunt trauma, as well as chemical injuries. And who fared the worst among patients with injury? We saw that patients with direct KIP injuries had the worst outcomes. They presented and had final vision averaging hand motion to light perception. Two-thirds developed retinal detachments and 40% had underwent enucleation. Which types of eyes required surgery and which types of surgeries did they require? There were 22% of cases that had open globe injuries. Um, in addition to these, uh, 16, there were also 16 cases of retinal detachments, eight of which underwent surgical repair, primarily by uh, combined buccal vitrectomies. There were seven cases also of, of retinal detachment, and in those, uh, the eye was inoperable due to the severity of the trauma, and those were all in the setting of KIP injuries. In addition, there were six cases of enucleation, all in the setting of direct KIP injury. So it sounds like KIP trauma resulted in the worst outcomes? Yes, that's correct. Patients with KIP injuries had significantly worse initial and final vision. They had higher rates of detachment and higher rates of enucleation compared to people uh, who had injuries by other mechanisms. Interestingly, uh, patients who were wearing eye protection had significantly better uh, presenting and final vision. 
and they were less likely to suffer a retinal detachment and require a nucleation. Thanks for coming on the show and sharing your data, Dr. Khaleesi's. Thanks for having me. That's all she wrote for this year's New Retina Radio coverage of the AAO annual meeting. Go back in your podcast feed to listen to our other episodes. If you are a subscriber to the podcast, then congratulations, you're doing it right. If you're not yet a subscriber, simply click subscribe on whatever app you're using. Or if you're listening on the iTube site itself, find the subscribe section toward the top of the page to select your podcast streaming service of choice. Thanks for joining us.